Well, welcome to the Ontology Summit 2021 on ontology generation and harmonization. Today is the 31st of March, 2021. And this is our first synthesis session. So I'll begin by um, giving the narrative for our summit this year. So ontologies are increasingly being generated rather than being manually built. As a result, ontologies are proliferating, producing a landscape of many types for many purposes. And this has made it difficult to communicate about them and between them. So there is a need for harmonization. It isn't enough to construct ontologies, they must be sustained. Okay, so first let's look at the generation part, which is increasingly being done with neuro symbolic methods. So it's been recognized that there are significant benefits for tighter integration of neural and symbolic paradigms. But how can this be done? Well, there are different roles that the neural and symbolic models could perform in a system. And as a result, we're seeing a landscape of different neural symbolic methods. Um, actually, it was Henry Kautz that um, was quoted in one of the talks, who will be speaking, I guess, in next week, I hope. Um, so Ram described three different ways that ontologies and neural network machine learning techniques can be um, related to each other, could generate ontologies, you could use the ontologies to develop better neural network models. Or you could have a full symbiosis of both of these paradigms. So in our talks, there were quite a few examples of the symbiosis where neural and symbolic methods were combined. So uh, Lewis Lamb, mentioned various connectionist modal models, connectionist temporal models. Pascal Hitzler had a variety, four different ways of combining neural and symbolic methods. So there's this using memory networks, uh, generative reasoning using pointer networks, uh, completion reasoning emulation, and logic tensor networks. Quite a variety starting to emerge. Then Aaron talked about generating ontologies from graph signal processing. And John Sawa discussed uh, cognitive memory. In general, modularity can be a very important tool in the creation of ontologies. And uh, I believe several people actually talked about this, but uh, Lewis Lamb in particular um, made a pitch for that. Then, um, so we also had a track on the ontological landscape. Todd made it, you know, we talked about how ontologies are for communication. And he classified a number of ways in which this communication can occur. One interesting problem is communication between non-technical and technical people. So the interface between these two is fundamental to ontology development. That came out twice. 
uh, once when uh, Mike Bennett was speaking and he uh, got into a lot of detail. And also when uh, Aitlin Woods was talking, talked about connection between natural language and first order logic. John pointed out that dialogue is an essential requirement. So it's not just a one way communication. Uh, this came out also in uh, Bennett and Woods, where they showed the uh, iterations that occur, that must occur in uh, between these two languages, non-technical and technical. Uh, Todd gave an initial classification of ontologies into four main types. However, it's also clear that the ontology landscape has many dimensions and aspects. And Mike Bennett raised this issue of truth makers and data surrogates, which is related to the ontology landscape because it, uh, the choices that you make regarding the truth makers and the data surrogates affect what type of ontology you're going to use, you're going to develop and use. Another dimension that Claudio pointed out is this, you know, it's actually a continuous dimension from the capital O ontology of philosophy to the engineering ontologies, okay, low level application ontologies, and, but there are many in between. And, and he advocated for a pluralistic attitude toward notions of reality. He then mentioned yet another dimension from capital L logic to lowercase logic, uh, which represents yet another dimension going from different, between different forms of reasoning. And Claudio also brought up the issue of modularization. Uh, and also an intriguing one. What does it actually mean to make an ontological commitment? Then our, we have our track on definitions. Um, Gary and Celia talked about the notion of definition. And it became clear that writing a good definition requires training and experience. Too many people just assume they know how to write a definition. And then just we end up with really uh, completely unacceptable, unusable definitions that confuse more than help. And Andrea pointed out that even for well understood domains, the results of manual classification tasks are highly inconsistent. Again, we really need to have good training, um, experience, and techniques, um, which Andrea talked about a good deal. And uh, Pierre Buttigieg gave some examples from the earth sciences. Now, Kai, I believe it was Kai that talked about this. Creating definitions is actually a collaborative effort that occurs within and between communities. So we need to recognize the collaborative aspects, the dialogue aspects, and the fact that there can be many stakeholders in a definition. And Andrea then um, talked about using events and narratives as an effective means for communication. And um, as I mentioned before, the interface between business or natural language and the technical language, first order logic, helps with human machine communication. Now, synthesizing all of this will be hard. <laughs> just going over all of the material that we've had so far with our first seven sessions is just a formidable task. And I apologize if I oversimplified 
some of your presentations, um, compressing down um, 15 to 30 minutes of presentation into a single line uh, can certainly miss a lot of the subtleties and nuances. What's more, we have seven more sessions to go. Accordingly, it's time to start the discussion. And I open yeah. up the floor and we begin. Okay, Alex has your hand up. Alex, begin. Unmute yourself. Uh, sorry, actually, uh, I have only idea to uh, emphasize one important thing about definitions that our ontologies are full of informal definitions and have lack of formal definitions. And this is uh, uh, one exciting journey in all different kind of ontologies. This is what we should do first of all, to study how we use uh, definitions in our real ontologies. This is the point. Gary, can you comment on that? Well, um... I think it's an element of what we want to do in terms of synthesis, but I see this, uh, this synthesis being relatively, uh, the structure of it being relatively simple and definitions would play a role in that. But I like um, starting with a landscape view and within the landscape view, definitions and formal formality certainly has a role to play and we can provide examples, but I also like I would think in terms of a synthesis, we want to balance uh, some practical elements along with, uh, with formal elements on it. And uh, we see examples in automatic generation of ontologies or definitions as being one of these emerging areas in the landscape that will really help us. So I, I, I think we have a, in terms of a synthesis, I think we have a natural structure here going through the track, starting with landscape. Uh, the question is what's, what might be second or third in, in our synthesis, but uh, formality plays a role in that, but I'd like a more balanced view of that. Uh, John captures a little bit of that element in, in talking about dialogue and the messiness of certain things. Okay, good, good. Try to capture some of this in the uh, chat. So Kenneth? So Todd, you're the next one. I'm sorry, I got here late. Um, in terms of definitions, there seem to be some implicit assumptions about the goal of having a definition or more than one definition. And to it, uh, the example I'll present is the one that we had to come up with or use for the IOF in that there are three types of definitions. There is a natural language definition. There's a, well, actually there's four. There's a natural language definition uh, which should is supposed to, um, I'll say, resonate with a su subject matter expert. Then there's a first order logic definition, which is in first order logic, using some notation for it. Then there's an intermediary that goes between the natural language and the first order logic to help people who are not familiar with either first order logic or the particular notation. That would help them um, understand how the natural language definition got formalized. And then, of course, if we're doing things in OWL, then there's the OWL definition, it's formalization in terms of uh, what do they call it, restrictions and so on. And of course, like as you say, there's a fourth, or I'm losing track here, fifth definition, which is the common logic formal definition. So the question I posted in the chat was, what are the requirements of the definition? Who are you trying to communicate with by using a one or more definitions? Very good point. Again, the ontologies we're talking about are not philosophical entities. They're information system entities, and hence they're engineered artifacts. And if they're engineered artifacts, there should be some requirements, uh, either implicit or explicit, preferably explicit, as to the goal of the ontology itself. And then in particular, if we're focusing on definitions, what are the, what are the definitions going to be used for or for whom? 
again, there's multiple players or stakeholders. Uh, one of those stakeholders are the actual machines. So we can't forget the formal definitions, but uh, ultimately we have to make sure that humans can understand the intent of the definition and the, in particular, the expected interpretations, the models of the ontology. So I, I would just uh, add to this a bit and uh, we, we could go on about this a long time, but we shouldn't necessarily go too long that the observation is that there's an explosion of definitions in, uh, in various domains. Uh, we know about that historically from the medical, but these definitions are conflicting. And so the, some degree of semantic analysis is helping us resolve that. And we've had some discussions part of the, 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 uh, the summit on techniques, methodologies, improving on knowledge engineering methodologies with, with, uh, with uh, definitions in mind to harmonize some of these things. There's a degree with, to which we can do that practically. There's some automated uh, approaches to this. There's a use of controlled natural language to express definitions, for example. So there's, there's quite a few more types of definitions uh, than what Todd mentioned, although that might be a focus. Uh, within an ontology, uh, there are imported definitions that come from a, a domain, even, even like Wikipedia. Um, and then there are harmonized definitions over time to improve on these type of things, along with the axiomized definitions. And finally, there is the comments on it, which are more encyclopedic, which are of use to humans to say, we didn't express everything in the axioms. We expressed necessary and sufficient conditions and what we could do within our representation. But for a human, you may want this larger context. So I think those are some of the ideas we want to express about this. And I think the very important point is where sort of where we are in terms of best practices and where the challenges are for automation and having uh, methodologies to do this because we haven't had that in the past when constructing or maintaining ontologies. So if I may, <clears throat> Gary, you're correct. There are multiple definitions out there. And the one of the problems, of course, is that we're using the same string of natural language symbols, like words and terms, to be associated with a particular def natural language definition. But I think the important point you brought out is the issue of context. So when you create a domain, either manually or automatically, it's being created for some use in some particular domain. So there's uh, assumptions about those definitions in that they are relative to the domain in which you expect your ontology to be used. So uh, you're right, there's probably other definitions and I guess one I missed would might be the definition for the whole ontology itself, i.e. what domain are you covering? What assumptions are you making? And rather than having assumptions listed as comments, there should be, an ex the annotations should be identified explicitly as assumptions. Yes, I did. what I would just add to that is when we publish things about an ontology, particularly an ontology design pattern, as you know, uh, we, we try to publish competency questions that define mm -hmm. the scope. What the, the pattern or this piece of ontology is good, is, is knowledgeable about and good for answering questions. Now, to, to some extent, we haven't really gotten that into our, our formal ontology that are published in the repositories, but it, it would help to have that type of thing. And again, this, oh. this is, my point would be that this is a modification of ontological methodologies. Yes, yes. And those competency questions could be just listed under requirements. Here are the requirements and here's the ontology that sort of meets the requirements. But I definitely agree. The, it needs to be a change in the development procedures. And that's sort of taking part or taking it happening, but piece, piece by piece. Uh, one of the problems is people are very familiar with UML, SysML, uh, relational database modeling and so on. And in those situations, the notion of these natural language definitions or explanations of the intent of a representation are, mm, shall we say lacking? Yeah. One other point I would make in response to uh, what Alex uh, said about formality uh, as part of my presentation, you noticed I talked about, I showed and talked about semantic gradient, the semantic ladder, uh, semantic spectrum, as it's sometimes called, going from textual things at the bottom through richer structures like taxonomies, all the way to the formal things that are sort of the idea of the goal that Alex is talking about. And the point I try to make about that is that all levels are important. We need to harmonize between these levels and we need to harmonize within these levels. And that's sort of the challenge of building quality at every single level. 
Um, I just noticed a comment from Alex. Alex, you sent something to me saying, to be, quote, to be precise, full and contextless. Contextless. Uh, could you explain that? I don't know how you can avoid context. Yeah, actually, uh, this is, uh, let's say, subtle and uh, big topic. And uh, you remember we had maybe a whole summit about context. Oh, yeah. And then I mentioned that I, I didn't use this word. And this is um, idea, let's say, from physics. When you study a system physically, you are not using context as a... Oh, of course you are. The context mm -hmm. is physics or physical entities. And then there's also the assumptions about the, the uh, I say space and time that you're making in doing, thinking about it, even thinking about physics. So this context, there's always context there. I don't, am I, I mean, uh, no, no, uh, look, uh, categories like time, space, matter, this is not a context. This is a uh, context depends over the task and for the task you, um, oh. let's say you have or goal you have. And you always have space, time, and matter. Those, a, oh, I'm sorry. Context is for particular no. discipline. This is a context. I mean, uh, yeah, I don't. Yeah. I don't think we should. Yes. Yeah, I, go I, in I, this direction. It's getting off on a tangent. But we may discuss this by letter. We we can discuss this offline. Okay. Um, but. Uh, Yet another dimension you have to consider are different forms of logic. There's modal logic, there's um, probabilistic logic. Um, it's not unusual for definitions to have, to mention things like usually occurring in or typically, words like that really don't easily translate into first order logic, although it's possible. Well, um, BFO 2020 tries to address some of that in that they have a temporalized version so that you can say something participates at some time, which of course, you know, you could translate to say there exists some time interval and blah, 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 blah. Right. And, and also um, I had talked about, this is Andrea, I had talked about using like RDF star properties to add probabilities to, to um, a predicate, a subject object predicate triple, which can start to take you down that way or to define a rule as a prototypical or a default. Yeah, I, I can tell you about work that I've done on that. So um, we should take that offline. Okay, Ravi has his hand up, unless you wanna continue this discussion. I'm open. Okay, go ahead, Ravi. One second. Uh, sorry, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. I've been typing a lot of things in the chat and on top of my mind is the end statement that you made at the end of your presentation, Ken, which I thought was very nice because we had forgotten what everyone had spoken and the speakers really went into a lot of depth. Andrea, all those people who came, Arun and uh, John and many others, Hitzler, Mike, you know. So thanks for bringing that on one page. But the basic question is, did we choose the tracks with harmonization and integration in mind? or we chose the tracks because they made some kind of sense and we found people interested in those tracks. And now we are left with synthesis of those tracks. So first question I would request audience to comment on is whether the tracks were natural to the topic of harmonization and how dependent are these tracks on how these ontologies are generated? Well, we do have this narrative that I began with 
that kind of links it all together. Which one? This is my basically the uh, second slide. Did you see my presentation? I'm I'm on your slide. I'm going to second slide just now. I is have the, the PDF open. So is this I the don't one? Need to is this the one labeled on narrative, the, Kenneth? Yeah, the narrative. Okay. Where is the definition entering in this? And where is neurosymbolic integration and harmonization with the rest? You do cover generated. more than 50%. Generated is the neural yes, symbol. That, that is fine. No, generated and harmonized are two. These are in our topic or theme. Ontology generation and harmonization. Of Generalize. which there are four parts. Landscape, neurosymbolic, definitions, and one more, right? I forget. Sustainability. Sustainability. Ah, where? which we have not yet addressed, right? We haven't had a session I'm on in it. The set. Yeah, so. So I think they I all mean, fit together pretty well. It's a good narrative. Well, okay. So then if you would not mind looking at some chat questions, either offline when we have time or whatever, I do raise those questions, but maybe Maybe you begin to address them from this narrative. Uh, does everybody see a kind of natural integration or can we think of four more tracks that would fit into a uh, generation and harmonization theme? That's well, my question. Well, okay. What I found as I was synthesizing for this, for my presentation just now, Yes. was that, um, okay, I, I found that it wasn't always that easy to put a, uh, you know, a given idea into one of the tracks, which is an indication that the tracks are pretty well integrated, that they are related to each other a good deal. So, so I mean, since you are probably among the first ones at least I am not there where you have already reached in synthesis because you have looked at what each speaker said and meant and how it fits together in the bigger picture. Certainly in the remaining eight slides, you have uh, tried to cover it. Now, my, my question is, again, back to the fact that of completeness, have we completed um, all aspects relating to, well, let's divide it even into two parts, generation and harmonization. Whether we generated, somebody else generated, ontologies exist. So harmonization among existing ontologies is one question. The second question is how we generated them, does the harmonization succeed more if we generate them in a particular way. I like that last point, Robbie. So this is Gary. I might, I might try my interpretation of, of what we're about here. Um, I think we started with the idea that there are some areas of interest, uh, such as automatic generation of ontologies, harmonization of definitions and the challenges of staining ontologies. Uh, so those are, in a sense, an important part of the landscape. We introduce those uh, concepts within the landscape. So we take a look, we draw back a little bit before going into these three particular areas and give a little bit of a history and a view of the overall landscape. And these things pop out in a sense of being current areas of work, interest, and opportunity. 
So given that, we might not have started that way, looking at the overall landscape. We started with saying, what are some of the interesting topics here? But given that we, we have settled on these three areas, uh, we can sort of surround them with a larger concept of the landscape. And I think that they naturally come out of certain things like our past summit on knowledge graphs. Like these things are, are relevant to construction of good knowledge graphs. There is the issue that we might argue about in terms of the role of context within each of these things. Uh, for example, that ontologies are defined within a particular con uh, context and how do you then expand them over time? So that's my particular take on the rationale for this structure, which I, I sort of like. The feature again is these three areas uh, with some side trips uh, um, among them, but it's all encompassed by the idea of the ontology summit likes to sort of look at the overall landscape and where ontologies are playing a role and what's new and, and people should know about in terms of ontologies. Great question, very well oh. said. Very, very well. Uh, both of both Todd and Gary have really raised our, um, at least my way of looking at this synthesis. Um, but um, please uh, do not misunderstand. I'm just using it as an idiom. Are we trying to fit something in a square, square circle in a square? sort of thing, or is it a natural um, way that we have thought of these four tracks and it is a natural progression that will lead to harmonization? That's a very good question. And I think we definitely have to address that. Uh, perhaps not now, we might wanna wait yes. until the Second synthesis. I'm sorry, Kenneth or Ravi, could you re repeat that last question of Ravi's? What was it? That's my question. Ravi, what, what, <laughs> what was the last question you, post, you posed that Kenneth thought was a good idea for, but should be taken up in the second synthesis session? So whether, we, whether it is a natural fit that we really are um, that, the, that these aren't just four completely independent. Yeah, tracks. very good. good. Good way of putting it, Ken. I will try to, Janet, will you try to catch it like you did the last one? How we generate ontologies impact their harmonization. Similarly, uh, did we stumble on these four tracks and then now we are trying to integrate and make sense of them? Or are these the natural elements whenever you talk of either generation or harmonization of ontologies? Even well, if they're not, even if they're not naturally, you know, sort of subcomponents of, uh, say, harmonization. Yet, if these four help us, then we can find some missing pieces as we go along. As so, we synthesize, we'll find out maybe these two we should have included or whatever. No, that's, that's a good point to make. And I feel we really should uh, address it. And uh, well, to a large extent, I think I'm the one who created these tracks. Mm -hmm. uh, I did consciously try to make sure that they did you know, fit together. I, they weren't just four independent tracks. So Kenneth, in terms of harmonization, is it, could it be the case that depending on the type of ontology <clears throat> that you're developing, you know, I, I think I identified four types that, that uh, increase in de detail and then hence the constraint on the models. Could it be the case that harmonization uh, is related or the amount of harmonization that can be achieved is dependent on the level of ontology or the type of ontology you're developing, whether it's foundational, reference, domain, application. That is the harmon in that in that ordering. If you want to think of that as some sort of ordering, a linear ordering, the harmonization decreases as you get more and more detail, or the possibility of harmonization decreases as you get more and more detail. That's possibly true, um, but I mean, there's also 
quite a landscape now of different neural symbolic techniques. And so then this question, what kind of ontologies are these developing? Are these Fred, generating? Isn't it, isn't it the case that some of those techniques, some of those processes, uh, which I think are mostly based on machine learning, except for the ones that um, uh, Arun talked about, can be uh, seeded with some basis from which they will start making some of their categorizations or distinctions? I think all of them really are explicitly or implicitly seeded. Okay. Uh, even those where it isn't explicit. Oh, um, right. yeah. What happens is that the way you construct yes, yes. your neural network model is implicitly putting in your, yeah. your ontology. Or some assumptions, anyway. Or seeding, in, or yeah. perhaps a way of looking at it is ontological commitment, whatever that means. Well, the models that are possible, yeah. Yeah, yeah when, when you look at those models that they create, say, so yeah, there's already a, no, 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 an assumption the, of, a, of an ontology there. Not the models that they create, the models in which those, whatever representation you get, can be satisfied. Right. The Tarsus. Exactly. Yeah, you, you, you oh. see that happening. <laughs> so can I say something now? So go uh, ahead, so there, is, there, is, there is obviously some connection between how a knowledge, how an ontology is, um, I will put in quotes, properly or correctly generated using at least one methodology or one set of notations, logic, or principles. If you develop many ontologies conforming to those initial conditions, I will use this, I will use UML, I would do this, uh, whatever way, or RDBMS, whatever consistent way we develop many ontologies, are they more likely to be harmonized? or the harmonization primarily depends on domain knowledge? Well, actually, Ravi, that's a rather interesting uh, question in my mind. When we talk about harmonization, what do we mean? Do we mean that it's technically harmonized? They're all done in OWL, they're all done in common logic or first order logic, or the natural language definitions are in harmony, or the sets of models are somehow mapped to each other equivalent or the set of models is isomorphic or something like that. So what do we mean by harmonization? Maybe we haven't addressed that adequately. Todd, I just wrote excellent from Todd. So we have to listen to the recording to get back to what uh, you really meant, but that is a eye opener for me. Well, that was your question, I thought, other. Robbie. Uh, and I also feel that and that it is all of the above that you mentioned. Plus, well, I give one use case. One well, use case because we are, many of us are enterprise architects in this gathering. And we would understand that when we try to harmonize something, let's say even the architecture, we are looking across domains or across the functions of the organization. And well, then when a... we are able to reach that, then we call it is our now harmonized. Well, oh, this is Gary. So I, I spoke about this, and we've had other people speaking about this. We've had talking about representing ontologies in natural language and first order logic, why we need both. Mm -hmm. If we, we need both, the idea is we need to have them harmonized. We want to have both of them. Very early in my uh, presentation, I talked about the harmonization with it for meaning understood by people and the harmonization of the forma uh, formalizations. And there's a balance between these two. So the meetings that people understand are large, including background knowledge. So what I try to say about harmonization in that context is that we want to at least make sure that our axiomizations in some form of logic address necessary and sufficient conditions of the definition, the meanings and the definitions as people understand them. So that doesn't mean everything of the definition might be in the ontology, but there is a degree in which they are uh, the necessary and sufficient conditions are understood in a logical way and people can understand them also. It doesn't mean that everything about a definition is harmonized because 
there are some things that are hard to express. But that the point is that we are moving towards making these more aligned, which is part of the harmonization process and documented. Very good. Okay, do you have more questions, Ravi? Yes. Um, so if, if provenance of cre creation, provenance of creation can be indicated to be a strong, successful, harmonized ontology, then at least we have one method of how to arrive at whatever we call harmonized ontology. Namely by type of generation. Um, then uh, I personally also feel that domain knowledge would play a very, very large role in harmonized ontologies. And I'm constantly picturing three things. Mm, you know, things like uh, uh, medical, Medline, and these NLM, uh, all these holdings and their practical applications across overlapping domains, clinical, research, new genes, etc. I mean, it's an overlapping, overlapping set of ontologies. Are these harmonized? Bioontologies may very advanced. Are these now harmonized ontologies? or are they still kind of separate? Well, if you look at some of the natural language definitions of the term harmon harmonize, one of them is that um, you can sing together. So if we take that as a metaphor, um, one way to understand harmonization of ontologies is that they can operate together. Now, exactly, if we take that literally, that would mean that we could just take ontologies that we'll call harmonize and throw them into an application and everything's going to work hunky-dory. So interoperation is one criteria for harmonization. Well, I didn't say interoperation. Uh, again, if we take the metaphor of... Uh, say playing, collaborating or playing together or whatever you want to call it. Well, working together. I chose to call it in... Okay. Inti integrate or, huh? Well, integrate can mean a whole bunch of things also, Robbie. You well, I, I don't know which word to use. Yeah, understood. This is Work together. <laughs> yeah. Well, my, my simple-minded example would be you have a set of ontologies that are considered harmonized. You, literally, you can throw, in, throw them into a triple store, into your information system. Everything works as expected or, yeah. Well, another thing that we said about this, and again, we need to address this in the communique, is that when we think of the ontological spectrum, uh, the hierarchy, uh, there's harmonization uh, between the levels. And so we can talk about things that are, are harmonized between these particular levels. For something like data interoperability, we want to we want to be able to automate that. Uh, and therefore, there has to be some formalization. So as we're talking about harmonization, shouldn't forget about formalization as part of that. Things can be harmonized in a technical way saying, well, they use the same words and they have the same uh, 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 superclasses, for example. But we want to make sure that we also add that they are, that the axioms are, are, are harmonized so that they uh, would support things like automated interoperability. Very good. I, I see the connection that if you have made an ontology using a particular type of logic, which implies axioms, etc., um, uh, which includes axioms, etc., then you are talking of um, not only the ontology being, why as Todd would call it, work together, uh, it also satisfies the uh, conditions required for axioms to be true. Well, for, for me, the most important part of it is that they're conceptually aligned and harmonized, but two different ontologies, to take an example, might be rep represented differently 
one using common logic and one using uh, a lower form of logic, so forth. So there's a representational harmonization that's, that's uh, sometimes uh, can block things from, from working together. You have to realize that there are many elements in, the, in this, including representation. So in general, Gary- I'm primarily you... interested in the conceptual level. But Gary, your situation where you have, say, something done in common logic, something done in OWL, literally the set of models it for, OWL, for the OWL representation will be larger than those for common logic because OWLs really can't do much. But Kenneth's question uh, is quite interesting. So disharmonization, non-harmonization. But Kenneth, if we try and specify those disagreements, disagreements of what or with what? So is this pairwise disagreement or a set of uh, disagreements uh, that is disagreements among a set of ontologies? Yeah, that's the problem. I mean, has this even ever been addressed? Well, you're talking about the complement effectively of harmonization, right? No, when, when I mean, we agree that sometimes, you know, uh, ontologies can't be communi can't be integrated because they disagree. They're in mutually inconsistent. Logically inconsistent, ontologically inconsistent, or? Uh, any, there's various forms of inconsistency. Yeah, yeah. Um, right. and, and that's the general point. There are various forms of inconsistency. Therefore, there will be various forms of harmonization or lack of harmonization. It's, it's like this, uh, this stack model of one thing on top of another. There are many levels, and uh, uh, they can, they can, the lower levels may be consistent, but the upper levels may be inconsistent. Yes. I mean, we, in biology, you might think, oh, there's there's one taxonomy for all of life. <laughs> in fact, there are multiple taxonomies. And of course, those different taxonomies disagree with one another. And they no. explicitly say how they disagree. Oh. Yeah, I can. Are those um, on um, taxonomies ones that are accepted concurrently or over historical period? Concurrently, actually. Oh, okay. They, there are several at the same time. Right yeah, now. it's like it's like the uh, the definitions. Uh, they could be standardized by different groups, but they are they differ among between themselves, even though both are standards in a way. So the question is, for example, are viruses alive? That's something you can, you know, hasn't been settled. You can argue about based on a criteria for life. Oh yeah, well, they're, they're really fundamental disagreements even at the highest levels, as you say, Gary. So is there, are there standards? Are there, is there a, you know, is there a way that you can specify how ontologies disagree? Um, you know, what form of disagreement it takes? Um, what are the well, limits of harmony, harmonization of different ontologies, either pairwise or in groups? Well, technically we could look at logical inconsistencies and those can be identified automatically. Uh, now, whether you can easily identify conceptual diff disagreements as might be more certainly manual at this point, I think, process, but that would be really hard. Um, so there's logical inconsistencies or differences, ontological differences, which we might consider uh, conceptual differences. Are there other po po potential differences? Well, as, as ontologies are being generated now, question is, can they be generated so that these inconsistencies would be recognized, would be, would also be generated. Um, yes. Okay, that leaves some uh, yes. but problems, are... Kenneth, because the generation, you said generation multiple ontologies. So then I would suspect that there are, they're being generated for different reasons or with different starting assumptions or something different at the start? Yes. So then you'd want to look and see how those differences propagate through to the result and then compare those results to see what is generated as a result of the initial differences? Yes, that's the idea. Well, Especially if well, it, it wouldn't necessarily be for different purposes, but you may be modularizing. Well, that's a different purpose then. 
Right, right. But I mean, you, you're attempting to do one, one purpose, but you're grabbing modules that were created for somewhat different purposes. Oh, so what, you're starting with different things or starting at a different place or uh, criteria or input? Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's, and this kind of thing happens all the time, of course. Oh, I like Janet's idea of the taxonomy of ontology pathologies. <laughs> <There's>... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Janet, what is yeah, that's, comment on that's that? That's probably, that's easier to do than, um, than to set out the uh, prescriptions for, um, for quality, at least, you know, it's a, they go together, but um, yeah, taking the negative view of uh, what can one foresee of the different um, uh, disharmonizations, uh, inconsistencies. So the operating together would be co-operating. So um, what do we know at this point about um, uh, foreseeable uh, risks of disharmony? And how how can those be seen as uh, you know connectable to these issues in generation? I think the generation and harmonization and sustainability that that is a that's a good um, trio of um, uh, insights or you know a focus that um, I think it it hasn't quite been crystallized as one uh, motivating question, but I, I think it is um, promising. Yeah, well, these disharmonies or whatever disagreements uh, don't necessarily prevent um, working together. People work together in spite of such disagreements, after all. But are you right. talking about operations? That is one of the things, yeah. Uh, I was going to say that is one of the things that we know by now um, that should be brought out. That um, that uh, rather than searching for a, a perfect system, um, dealing with disharmonies uh, and mitigating and uh, supporting and learning, right and dialoguing that kind of thing um, is the more uh, sophisticated view. So, Kenneth, when you said working together, do you mean operationally in some information system or? Uh, prior to, you know, actually implementing them or uh, loading them into some triple store? Well, I was thinking of downstream, not... What's downstream? No. Uh, the, uh, the, the systems then work together. Not that you are... I mean, certainly cooperation must occur during the creation, right? During the design. And uh, hopefully, one can mitigate such disagreements, and you know, people can cooperate. So you're talking but about. But I'm talking more about the later stages. So it sounds like interoperability. Is that... More interoperability. Okay. I mean, I, I uh, to give you a kind of trivial example, there was a an ontology I was looking at once where they had man and woman. Well, that seems reasonable, right? Most people know what a man and a woman are. Um, although these days, it's definitely getting more complicated. But um, then I looked at the ontology and I realized that both man and woman were subclasses of clothing in this ontology. <laughs> it was for a store. Right. Uh, how do you, I mean, uh, a naive, a naive attempt to integrate that ontology with an ontology, say a biology ontology, would would have some difficulties, I imagine. It'd be a waste of time. Perhaps that's one of the largest pathologies of ontology development is the people who are doing it are starting from, shall we say, a naive perspective. Yeah, that that's a way of looking at it. Um, yeah, people tend to be naive. They're not trained in ontology development. They're not trained in writing definitions. 
And they're not trained in analysis either. Or analysis, yeah, so. Well, actually, I might disagree with you. I think the people that are writing them are trained in programming. Yes. And, and I have kind of always said that there's this huge kind of disconnect between a programmer who's taught not to, you know, gold plate anything and not to expand beyond immediate needs and future proofing and, and thinking through the abstractions. And, and so it's kind of rare that you get a good programmer who translates into a good ontologist. Yes, good point. That's a good point, yes. You also have the question of um, <clears throat> good enough for use that, that again, you need to, you wanna foresee how your system might interact with people or other uh, automated systems um, and conceptualize the world from from those perspectives, but you can't come up with the um, you know the the God ontology, the one ontology, to uh, handle every foreseen or you know, unforeseen or unforeseen uh, circumstance. So yeah. so again, this is about mitigating um, sort of um, you know sort of baking in a um, robust awareness of um, reasonably foreseeable and risks, you know, reasonably foreseeable context of operation and, and risks that might occur. Um, but you don't want to say that everybody should have, um, you know, a standard, as Gary is pointing out, you know, um, some um, grand common ontology. So, well, um, we're running out of time. It's already one o'clock. Um, has anybody got any more comments that hasn't spoken yet? I'm, uh, I'm saying, and no, I mean, I'm sorry. I've spoken many times, so I'll be quiet. Thank you, Ravi. Please, we, we want to get a diversity, a lot of opinions into the discussion about synthesis. So feel free to speak up. Yeah. Uh, Kenneth, I put one last oh. item in the chat. Um, you can consider that later. Mm. Oh, so this, is, good point. this is Mike. I think the summary is that uh, it's about having different ontological commitments. And you start with the idea of automatically generated ontologies. So there's better be a huge challenge in how on earth does something that's generating ontology automatically have any notion of what ontological commitment it is generating within and how do you manage that process? So I think that's the takeaway from this. Very good point. But also perhaps we need, I don't know about this summit, to address the question of what ontological commitment is. Absolutely. Uh, Chris Partridge and a couple of others just wrote a paper over in the UK uh, about analyzing top level ontologies and tease down some of the dimensions of uh, ontological commitment, but I haven't looked at it properly. I wouldn't say whether it's necessarily complete, but it's certainly very exhaustive and worth a look as input to such a future session. Yeah, I think it's not really within the scope of this summit, no. but uh, hopefully at some point it will be addressed. Anybody else? Oh, um, are you finished, Mike? I'm done. Okay. Is there anyone else? This is uh, Gary. I would just note that I put some ideas in into the chat that it can be captured uh, for inclusion as part of the synthesis. Yeah, that's great, Gary. Yeah, I was just reading yours. Really interesting. Um, Please, anyone else? Um, I was a, I was a bit uh, late to the event, but um, I think some of the, uh, the the difficulty or the some of the uh, challenges in contemporary ontology is the fact that uh, uh, there's a lot of different disciplines and a lot of different um, uh, goals in mind. So, a from a computer science perspective, where you might have a project that has a specific uh, uh, goal in mind, some computational uh, some computational aim, uh, and 
a certain set of uh, requirements or a certain set of restrictions, uh, you might not have the same sort of uh, uh, content or rigor or, uh, or structure that you would say from a different project that takes a different perspective that might be more abstract uh, uh, with different resources. So you might have perspectives from linguistics, uh, computer science, uh, engineering, philosophy, and whatnot. And because the, the entire field, to the extent that it is a field of applied ontology, is dealing with oftentimes very highly abstract concepts, uh, you get into a lot of muddy waters, and uh, if you don't analyze those concepts uh, well enough or make things explicit, you can get various degrees of, um, of uh, precision or various degrees of uh, overlap or uh, distinction. Uh, and just the very the interdisciplinary aspect of it and the generality of it is uh, what makes things a little fuzzy if that makes sense. I think it makes sense. The difficult questions. Bobin has a question of me, but I think it is a question for rungs of the ladder. Yeah, Bobin, what do you mean by that? Robin, can you unmute? Yeah, my um, internet is kind of flaky and so it may or may not work, but let's try it. Um, it what that wonderful um, large piece that Gary put on the um, chat, um, I liked a lot. And he talked about levels of ladder, a ladder of upper and lower. And it seems to me that abstraction is one of the contexts that you need to really consider. I think Robert, Robert was just sort of aiming at that too, um, in terms of harmonizing ontologies. If, if they're on the same level of abstraction, that's great. If you have two lower ontologies that disagree in definition, you can always abstract up, which I think Janet implied a little while ago also in the chat um, to a common, a more common level of definition or concept. Um, so it's a that's a long answer to a short question that's in chat. In, oh, in looking, looking at the chat, uh, a couple of topics that are I think important are the that of the concept of terms themselves as well as the, uh, the ladder or the spectrum. So the first one, uh, the word term itself is often uh, used to signify the, um, the elements uh, of an ontology, but that itself uh, has, has had different senses. So uh, for example, some may use it to signify a particular word in a language, and then an ontology uh, provides a specific meaning for that. Uh, others may use it to signify um, uh, a category in a broad sense, uh, independent of say, uh, the actual word in the language. But I think it would be a mistake to, to try to, uh, for any ontology, to try to create a universal or assert the universal meaning for a given word as known in a language because the language itself is intended to be um, uh, basically fluid, context dependent, uh, just like we do in normal speech. Whereas the ontology is, a, is an artificial structure that is at least the computational ontology, not speaking about philosophical ontology. It's a computational structure intended ideally to uh, satisfy some goals and achieve some computational means. So I think it would be a mistake to try to uh, assert some sort of uh, end all meaning for a given word. Um, yeah, that, that's one That's one topic. The other is about the ladder versus the spectrum. Uh, Gary and I had a you know, correspondence about some work elsewhere about uh, the, the spectrum versus ladder. Um, I tend to think that the spectrum uh, conceptualization is more accurate in order to avoid any 
uh, any suggestion that the thing the things on the higher rungs of the ladder are somehow better, right? So a horizontal uh, conceptualization, a spectrum where you have various sort of tools or techniques or resources would is something I think more accurate. Uh, and then also the concept of levels. So uh, it's often thrown about, you know, uh, different levels of ontologies, but it, but ontologies, computational ontologies are actually, uh, there's, there can be many architectures. So the concept of levels assumes a certain uh, architecture. So uh, uh, John's uh, lattice, for example, just lattice structure, uh, when you have directed uh, acyclic graphs, you can have uh, non-directed and whatnot. So I think the, the using levels itself is not accurate enough because it assumes a certain architecture. So those are three, I think, uh, topics worth uh, exploring. Good, thanks. All right, anyone else? Okay, so with that, uh, we will adjourn and I would ask everyone to join us next week when we will have a session on neurosymbolic learning ontologies. Uh, two speakers are scheduled, Henry Kautz and Amit Sheth. And then two weeks from today, we're going to have our first session fully devoted to sustainability of ontologies. So thanks to everyone for joining. See you Thank all you. in the next few weeks. Thank you, Ken.